Well, good morning. We are now going to move on to Midway. So if you'd be so kind as to put up the first slide. Um, I'm entitling this talk, Digging into the Common Mythos Around Midway. And uh, next slide, please. What I'd like to accomplish today is a couple of things. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about the big picture. And some of this is going to be review of where we are sort of in the strategic situation uh, as a result of four or five months worth of combat in the Pacific. And then I'm going to talk, uh, give you sort of the, uh, the high level view of what actually happened at the Battle of Midway. As soon as I'm done with that, I want to drill down a little bit and look at one event in particular that happened during this battle and start going through some of the primary sources. I'm going to show you some things uh, that Tony Tully and I use to write our book. Um, and as a, a result of that, I think that we'll end up sort of reshaping that facet of the common wisdom around this particular battle. Next slide, please. All right, setting the stage. Next slide. So what has been going on up to this point? As we've heard all through yesterday, uh, there's been a lot of activity in the Pacific Ocean during the first four or five months of this particular war. Uh, of course, we kicked things off at Pearl Harbor. There were simultaneous operations aimed at uh, Guam and Wake. Uh, the Japanese invaded Hong Kong. They sank the Prince of Wales and Repulse off of Malaya and then put troops ashore on the Malayan Peninsula and began driving down towards Singapore. Next slide, please. Um, the result of those first phase operations is very successful for the Japanese, and uh, they accelerate their time schedule and uh, start initiating a second uh, series of operations, which results in various battles uh, in the Java Sea. We, of course, have the carrier raid against Port Darwin in uh, uh, northern Australia after uh, Rabaul has been taken. Uh, Singapore falls at the end of February, which is a calamity for British arms. Um, and as a result of all of this, you know, by about you know, the March-February time frame, it's pretty clear that the Japanese are going to secure all of the uh, economic aims that they had gone to war for in the first place. They're going to get the oil, they're going to get the rubber and tin, the other raw materials. And not incidentally, they will have ended up crushing white colonialism throughout their area of operations, which is a pretty big deal as far as they're concerned. So next slide, please. The question then starts being asked, uh, you know, well, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? And the Japanese run through a number of different options of things that they might want to do. Um, some of these we've discussed yesterday. We could, have, we could invade Australia. We could potentially go into the Indian Ocean. Um, we can move down the Solomon Islands chains towards Fiji and Samoa and cut Australia off uh, its supply lines from the U.S. So there's a great deal of back and forth at this point and frankly a, a fair amount of political skullduggery uh, on the part of the Imperial Navy. But at the end of the day, Admiral Yamamoto wins uh, the bureaucratic infight necessary to have his vision for Pacific strategy be the one that is carried forward and we end up having a battle at the site uh, of Midway Island. And it's going to be a contest of wills, if you will, between Yamamoto on the one hand and Admiral Nimitz on the other. Next slide, please. Unfortunately for the Japanese, we have broken their operational codes. And although we are not by any means able to read all of their mail, we are able to read sufficient of it that we get wind of what is going to happen here at the island of Midway. Um, which allows Nimitz to then position his forces in such a way that he can ambush the Japanese when they come in. And at the end of the day, on uh, 4 June 1942, we're going to have uh, a very evenly matched fight at the tip of the spear, but it's going to go our way. And we walk away from that battle having sunk four Japanese aircraft carriers and lost only one of our own. Next slide, please. So. What does that do for us? I, I, would, I would argue that you know, even though I wrote a, a book on the Battle of Midway, Midway was not necessarily the most important or decisive uh, naval battle ever. But it certainly was very important in the Pacific War in terms of both short and long-term effects. Short term, what it does is it destroys the Japanese carrier striking force, which means that they are now deprived of their offensive capabilities. And that, in turn, drags our offensive capabilities back up to a state of parity with the Japanese. Now, you know, in these days of uh, unchallenged uh, US naval 
uh, might, if you will, in the world. It's, it's pretty hard to conceive of just being able to drag ourselves back to parity as being a big deal. But in the dark days of 1942, having achieved that goal is a very big deal indeed. Because what that allows us to do is then start contemplating uh, undertaking offensive actions of our own. Up to this point, we've been reacting to Japanese moves and we've never had an opportunity to actually go after them. Well, with Midway uh, in the bag now, all of a sudden, people like uh, Admiral Ernie King have got the option to maybe start doing some things of their own. And very quickly, what ends up happening is we take the offensive then at Guadalcanal. It is the creation of the campaign in the Solomons coupled with the campaign in New Guinea, which is going to create this sort of twin-headed attritional monster that ends up eating up the Japanese uh, naval and air forces and ground forces. That's the kind of war that we, as the more powerful opponent, need to get our weaker opponent into, get him into a headlock, and every day we're just beating him up. So Midway is the gift that keeps on giving in that respect because it allows us to create the kind of war that we need to create in order to win the larger conflict. Next uh, slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the common mythos um, of great battles, and I'm going to read you a brief passage from my book. We say, that all great battles create their own unique mythos. That is to say, they become wrapped in a set of popular beliefs the common wisdom that interprets the battle and its meanings. In many cases, this mythology centers on one pivotal event, some noteworthy occurrence that captures the imagination, thereby crystallizing what that battle was all about. History is replete with such uh, defining moments. The breaking of the French Imperial Guard at Waterloo, Pickett's charge at Gettysburg, the siege of Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. They are timeless events and not to be reinterpreted lightly. Yet it is imperative that such momentous happenings be understood properly, for if these are the lenses through which we perceive great battles, then it stands to reason that any flaws in these crystals must necessarily distort our perception of the battle as a whole. So if I had to you know, give the, the primary pivotal events within the Battle of Midway, I would argue that it is, next slide please, this one. The 1020 dive bomber attack against the Japanese carrier striking force. Next slide. It is that attack that shifts the, the momentum of that battle um, and essentially means that we're going to win it. Because during that attack, in a space of four or five minutes, as we heard Dusty Kleiss on the oral history say, we put three Japanese carriers out of action, and it's pretty clear that we're going to end up um, uh, winning that battle. And I would submit that it is those mental images of dauntlesses hurtling down on Japanese flight decks that are packed chock-a-block with aircraft that are this close to taking off. You know, that is certainly an image that I had as a child when I was beginning to delve into naval history, and I think it is one that pretty much any naval enthusiast would, would relate to. Unfortunately, there are aspects of that mental image that are incorrect, and that's what I want to drill into in a little more detail right now. Next slide, please. So June 4th, 1942, what we're going to be taking a look at is what was actually happening on the Japanese carrier flight decks during the course of that battle. And uh, one of the tools that I want to use to make that happen is another gentleman's book. Uh, this is Mitsuo Fuchida's book, Midway, the Battle that Doomed Japan. Fuchida's big shot. He's very important. Uh, he was the air group commander on the Akagi. He was the uh, strike leader at Pearl Harbor, of course and he was at the Battle of Midway as well, although he did not fly that day because he had had an appendicitis and he was invalided. Um, but he wrote a book in 1951 that was then translated into English in 1955. And this book, in conjunction with a couple of other primary sources, is pretty much the key uh, stone for a lot of the Western accounts on the Battle of Midway that get written. So we're going to use him and see what he says about what's going on on the flight decks. Next slide, please. So. Carrier Operations 101, the thing you need to keep in mind uh, while we're going through this examination is that we are living in the age before angled flight deck aircraft carriers, which means that our carrier can only be doing one thing at a time. It can be spotting aircraft, which means pulling them out of the hangars, moving them up to the flight deck and getting them ready to launch. We can be launching those aircraft, or we can be recovering aircraft. And particularly in the case of the latter, when we're recovering, that flight deck is shut down. We cannot be doing anything else except bringing planes aboard the aircraft carrier, okay? So let's just keep that in mind. 
Next slide, please. All right, let's do a brief walk through the battle. Phase one, next slide. 0430, this is the situation. We have uh, the Japanese carrier force, Kido Butai, coming in from the northwest at a distance of about 250 nautical miles away from the island of Midway, which you see down in the bottom. And then positioned off to the east-northeast, unknown to the Japanese, are the two American carrier task forces. Next slide, please. So at 0430, uh, flight operations commence on board the Japanese carriers. They send off a very powerful strike force uh, against the island of Midway, 108 aircraft under the command of a gentleman named Tomonaga. And let's see what happens on the flight decks according to Fujita after that, after the planes have been launched. The flight deck, which moments before had been filled with a deafening din, was now silent. There were no planes, no drone of engines. But the stillness was again broken by the raucous loudspeaker blaring out in order, prepare second attack wave. To the accompaniment of clanging bells, planes soon were being whisked up to the flight deck and rolled from the elevators to their lined up positions. The forward elevators brought up fighters, the midship and stern elevators delivered bombers. Maintenance crews wheeled torpedoes from the ammunition rooms and secured them to the planes. All hands worked feverishly. Admiral Yamamoto has given Admiral Nagumo an order that I want you to keep half of your planes in reserve for potential use against enemy ships if they are discovered. And so that's what these strike planes are going to be doing. And they are armed, therefore, with torpedoes and, and uh, armor-piercing or semi-armor-piercing bombs. Um, at about uh, 0630, uh, Midway is attacked by Tomonaga's group. And around the same time, the Kido Butai comes under its first series of attacks from some of the land-based air that is based at Midway. And these attacks are repulsed relatively easily by the Japanese combat air patrol fighters and result in no damage to the Japanese. Um, at the same time, though, Tomonaga radios back at about 0700 and says, we need a second attack against this objective. I have not put it out of business. We need to hit it again. Now, at this point, uh, Nagumo's had scout planes up in the air for several hours. He has received no word that there are any uh, American naval forces uh, in the area. And so at 0715, he decides, I am going to rearm my reserve strike planes and uh, get them ready for a second attack on, the bat on Midway. So let's see what Fujita says about that. Consequently, at 0715, just as the American torpedo attack was ending, Nagumo ordered the planes of the second wave, which had been armed for the attack on enemy ships, to prepare instead for another strike on Midway. This meant that the torpedo-laden bombers on Akagi and Kaga had to be de-armed and reloaded with bombs. The ones already on the flight deck were taken down to the hangar one after another, and the rearming process began. So the image he's painting for us is reserve strike was up on deck. Now we're taking them back down below deck. Next slide, please. Second phase of battle, next slide. So the situation is about this at around 07.45 uh, in the morning. The Japanese have been closing towards Midway so that I can recover my strike force when it comes back. But then lo and behold, out of the blue comes a sighting report from one of his uh, scout planes at 07.45 saying, I found something. Next slide, please. Well, this really throws a rock into the pigeons, if you will. This is a very unexpected event, and Nagumo is not at all happy to have this happen. Um, he immediately fires off a message back to this plane saying, please ascertain, well, not even please, ascertain the ship types, get on it, <laughs> and also immediately countermands his rearming order and tells those planes to now switch back again to anti-ship weaponry. So let's read what Fuchita has to say about that. And it'd be good if I had my book not upside down. On board Akagi, when the order was given to clear the deck for recovery, oh, I guess I'm not there yet. I'm sorry. Um, in any case, he issues another order, which means we've got to bring these planes back down to the hangar now and start uh, actually, you know, rearming them. At the same time, he's got to make a decision. I have got planes coming back. Uh, from Midway. Am I going to recover those planes first or am I going to strike against the Americans right now? And after kind of going through the numbers very quickly and very briefly, he decides, no, I've got to bring my strike force back first. I know that those planes are going to be low on gasoline. They're going to have wounded aviators on them. Um, I need to bring them down. So he makes the decision that he is going to do that uh, before he then respots his decks and goes off to attack the Americans. So. Um, 
Once uh, on board Akagi, the order was given to clear the deck for recovery. The weary maintenance crews began once more to lower the torpedo bombers to the hangar deck. There, the orders now were to switch back from bombs to torpedoes. So again, the planes were up, the planes were down, the planes were up, and now the planes are going back down a second time, apparently, into the hangar deck. All right. The problem now becomes for Naguma that he starts running out of time because at the, at the very moment that he starts making these decision, decisions, there's a second group of American air attacks that start materializing at around 0753. There's a group of dive bombers that come in and there's also some B-17s that start attacking his force. And those planes are going to be over his head for the better part of 40 minutes, just kind of buzzing around doing their thing. Um, they are not successful attacks. The dive bombers are chewed up very badly by the Japanese cap. The B-17s are relatively immune, but you know the result of their bombing attacks on the Japanese is they put a lot of bombs into the, into the ocean. Um, so then at this point, we now recover our strike planes at 0837. As soon as the B-17s finally drone off to the distance, Naguma goes ahead and brings his, his morning attack down. And now he's thinking to himself, OK, fine. I've got the morning attack down. It's time to respot my flight decks and go out and attack the Americans at this point. Next slide, please. Third phase. Next slide, please. Unfortunately for Nagumo, as soon as he has these planes recovered, lo and behold, another series of attacks start coming in. And these famously are the torpedo squadron attacks, first from uh, the Hornet. This is VT-8, which is annihilated in the course of this engagement. Uh, all planes shot down, one man left alive in the water. As soon as VT-8 is destroyed uh, by about 0930 or so, um, at 0940, VT-6 rolls in from the Enterprise and is similarly very roughly handled. So what ends up happening for Nagumo is he's not given an opportunity to actually get stuff up on, on his flight decks and he's reacting to American moves. And unknown to him, by the time that VT-6 is finally destroyed around 10 in the morning, he has now been sighted by two different groups of American aircraft. There's two squadrons of, of dive bombers from the Enterprise coming in from one direction, and there's a combined strike from the Yorktown coming in from the southeast. So he's uh, the Iceman cometh, if you will. Next slide, please. So this is sort of a schematic of what's been happening to Kita Butai here since about 08. Uh, 30 or so, and what you see down in the south is uh, the flat line there. That's where we're recovering aircraft. We then start moving off to the northeast to close the American carriers, but lo and behold, we are first attacked by VT-8, and our reaction to these attacks is we turn around and run, because if I put my fantail to a very slow uh, torpedo plane, it makes it a lot harder for that torpedo plane to close on me, and it gives my cap fighters a lot more time to chew those guys up. So. My standard uh, reaction is to run away from all of these attacks. And what you see happening on, with Kita Butai is it's being shoved around. VT-8 hits me, I run to the, I run to the west. VT-6 comes in from the south, I start running to the, to the northwest. And so you can see now that Kita Butai has been put in sort of a reactive mode, if, if you will. And finally, uh, what we have here is, as I described, we have the Enterprise planes coming in from the southwest. We have the Yorktown strike coming in from the southeast. And this is the hammer and anvil that is going to do in the Japanese combat air patrol. Next slide, please. So now let's look a little bit at some of the primary sources. Next slide. Okay, um, and just to sort of summarize where, where Fuchida has, has painted for us, he's basically painted us a picture where these reserve strike planes that were armed initially for any ship exercises have, have supposedly been put up on the flight deck, taken down, put up, taken down, you know, twice during the course of this morning. Um, but that in Fuchida's words, by 1025, which is when this dive bomber attack from the Americans is going to occur, all of those planes are now supposedly up on the flight decks, are armed, and are ready to go. So that is that is the common wisdom that we've been handed down here for the last 70 years or so. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to show you, um, and don't get daunted by this, but this is a schematic of the air operations that occur on all of the Japanese carriers. And the important things to note are the little blue boxes, which show us uh, the duration of American attacks against the, the carrier force, and the little yellow triangles, which means 
I am bringing down combat air patrol fighters onto my flight deck. And as you recall, when I'm recovering aircraft, that means that the fantail is completely occupied. I cannot be spotting aircraft, okay? So the visual impression is a fairly busy one, and that's exactly the right impression. You should look at this and say, these flight decks were busy, busy places. And that makes sense because there's a constant stream of American air attacks coming in, and not surprisingly, the Japanese have got to cycle a lot of combat air patrol fighters up and down. Next slide, please. Next thing we can look at is some actual photography that was taken during the battle. And these were taken by those B-17s that we talked about that came in at 0753 and buzzed around until around 0, uh, 0830 or so. So the first uh, ship that we have is the Soryu. And we can see on her fantail there in the very back, there's one zero fighter position there. But otherwise, her flight deck is completely devoid of aircraft. Next slide, please. This is her sister ship, the Hiryu. Um, on her deck, amidships, you'll see three zero fighters. Those are combat watch number five of Lieutenant Mori Shigeru, who's going to be launched at 0826. We know this from the air group records. Next slide, please. And finally, we have the force flagship. This is the Akagi. And once again, on her flight decks, we see nada. We see that uh, this, this dark blue square uh, here on the flight deck, that's her forward elevator. That's where the fighters live. So she's probably in the process of either taking fighters down or she's going to bring some up. But the overall impression that we get when we look at these flight decks is there is nothing on these flight decks. And actually, the guy that first figured this out and brought it to my attention is John Lundstrom here. He gave me a call in my office back in 1999. He's like, what does this mean, John? Why are there no planes on here? And I had to respond, I have no idea. But that, uh, that gave me the impetus to then go out and start understanding a little bit better the deck mechanics around these, these flight decks and how they actually operated them. Next slide, please. So I think sort of inner, as an intermediate conclusion, we have to look at the, the photographic and the air operational evidence at, at hand and say to ourselves, something doesn't smell right about Fuchida's account. This just doesn't seem to jibe with what we're seeing here in Fuchida's book. And so now let's actually uh, uh, take a look at, at, at what Fuchida says about the 1025 attack. And this is probably one of the best passages in his entire book. He calls it Five Fateful Minutes. Preparation for a counterattack against the enemy had continued on board our four carriers throughout the enemy torpedo attacks, VT-8, VT-6. One after another, planes were hoisted from the hangar and quickly arranged on the flight deck. There was no time to lose. At 10.20, Admiral Nagumo gave the order to launch when ready. On Akagi's flight deck, all planes were in position with engines warming up. The big ship began turning into the wind. Within five minutes, all her planes would be launched. Five minutes. Who would have believed that in that uh, that the tide of battle would shift completely in that brief interval of time? At 10:24, the order to start launching came from the bridge by voice tube. The air officers uh, flapped a white flag, and the first zero fighter gathered speed and whizzed off the deck. At that instant, a lookout screamed, "Hell divers!" I looked up to see three black enemy planes plummeting towards our ship. So again, the image that Fuchida is painting for us is that our strike force is ready to go, is just moments away from going, and all of a sudden, at the very last minute, down come the American dive bombers and, and catastrophe ensues. Um, next slide, please. Which brings me uh, to Carrier Operations 102. So if we look at the math behind how long does it take to actually spot the strike force on my flight deck, you got to do a number of things. I have to be pulling out my aircraft one at a time out of the hangar decks, putting them on the elevator up to the flight deck and rolling them into position. Once they're there, I've got to warm up their engines because Japanese uh, aircraft carriers have enclosed hangars with insufficient ventilation, which means I can't warm up my engines down below like I could on an American carrier. I've got to bring them up topside. I'm going to arm the dive bombers once they're on the flight deck um, and do some other nits and nats. But bottom line, is from the time Nagumo says go, it's going to take 45 minutes to put this flight deck, uh, or put this strike force together and get it on the flight deck, get it warmed up, and get it ready to go. If I cut some corners, I might be able to bring that down to half an hour, but I've got to have 30 to 45 minutes wherein my flight deck is not being used for any other purposes, okay? All right, let's move on. Uh, next slide, please. Which brings us to the part of the talk that I call fun with Kota Cho shows. And, and you're thinking to yourself, what is a Kota Cho show? And I'm glad you asked. 
Um, Kota Chosho's are the detailed Japanese air group records that all of these ships kept, and they give us a lot of really interesting information on what is happening within the air group. They tell us the names of all of the pilots that got into an airplane that day. We know when they went up, we know when they came down, we know how much ordnance they carried and what they expended. They give us a lot of detail. And from those records, we can start deducing a lot of what's going on on that Japanese carrier. For instance, if I know that at a certain time I'm recovering aircraft per the Kota Chosho, that means that my carrier must be pointed into the wind. So we can start to infer a lot about the movements of these carriers. So let's take a look at a Kota Chosho. Next slide, please. Isn't this lovely? <laughs> yes. Um, it's actually not that hideous, and that's why I've color-coded it for you. But if we look on the upper uh, left-hand corner in the yellow box there, that is the kanji for Akagi. Over to, uh, in, in the right, uh, the, the center in the red box there, that gives us the date. It is year 17, uh, Showa. Uh, it is the month of June, and it is day five, because His Majesty's warships keep Tokyo time wherever they operate. So it's June 5th in Tokyo, but it's June 4th uh, local near Midway. So this is um, her Kota Chosho for her morning strike. Um, down below in this other yellow box, we can see the number of aircraft that she employed. We have 18 dive bombers, we have a torpedo plane that's used as a recon bird, and we also have nine fighters. And then down below that, in the purple here, this linear strip, it tells us when the flight operations are actually occurring. So 0128 is when things kick off. Again, we're on Tokyo time, that's 0428 local. That's when her morning strike goes off. And then the blue box is giving us the ordinance that was expended. They tell us 18 number 25 common bombs, various machine gun ammo, yada, yada, yada. So that is uh, the first page of Hakodo. Next slide, please. If we look a little bit further, what we see are the detailed operations for her combat air patrol. So down the left hand, we'll see watch number one, watch number two, watch number three, watch number four. Uh, in the orange box there, we have the names of all the guys that got into the planes. We have the times that they took off. Again, her first combat air patrol watch took off at 0128, which is 0428 local. And there's the ordinance that was expended. What I want to point out to you is the purple boxes down here on the bottom, which are from watch number five and six. And if you'd click the slide for me, please. What we have here is these three gentlemen who are recovered on a Kagi at 1010 in the morning. These are guys that have gone up, they have shot VT6 to pieces, they are out of cannon ammo, and they need to come down and be refueled. So these planes land on the Akagi at 1010 in the morning, which is just 15 minutes before Akagi is bombed. This entry in her Kodo Show shows blows Fuchida's account completely apart. It means that it's nonsense because there is no way that I can get my strike force up on deck and ready to go in the 15 minute window of opportunity that this Kodo says that I have. And furthermore, next slide please. If we then go down in her Kodo to watch number nine here, you'll see an entry for next slide please a gentleman named Petty Officer First Class Kimura Koryo who takes off from the Akagi at 10.25 in the morning. And you recall Fuchida's passage in his book that the lead zero was whizzing off the flight deck. That's this guy. But the Kodo Chosho makes it absolutely clear that he is not part of a strike force. He's not a strike force escort. He is a combat air patrol pilot. So when we look um, at the air activities of Akagi and also at the other carriers, we come away with the impression that, you know what, all of those planes that those American pilots saw on the flight deck when they were bombing the Japanese were not strike planes at all. They were, they were combat air patrol um, planes. And that makes perfect sense because, again, these were very busy flight decks and we were beating off um, a constant string of attacks. Next slide, please. So, Fuchida's account in the words of, and I actually didn't make this up. Um, when we were doing the research on this book, we were um, confused about what these kodos told us. And I fired off two separate letters to two Japanese historians asking them to clarify what was going on here. So far as I knew, Fuchida was a war hero in Japan. And I certainly was not going to be impolite to the man. And so I couched this in very, you know, help me, the dumb historian, understand what is going on here. Fire off the letters. Letters come back from these two guys. One of them responds, to understand 
why Fuchida's account is a pack of transparent lies. You, you blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it turns out that Fuchida's account had actually been discredited in Japan for the better part of 20, 25 years, but we had not gotten word over on this side of the pond because, and, and you can understand why, because if you're going to figure out why his his account is a pack of transparent lies, you've got to have the gumption and to actually go and use the Kodo Cho shows, and they're hideous. I mean, why would you want to do that when you've got this nice, neat, you know, dramatic account in hand that's worked very well for us for the last 50 years? So, in essence, you know, the Japanese were nowhere near being ready to attack at 1025. They were still at least a half an hour away, and they may not have even begun spotting their aircraft at all. Um, and again, the only aircraft that are on those flight decks are combat air patrol fighters. So here is an instance where I would argue that history is fluid. And we are constantly reformulating history on the basis of new information that comes to us. And even though this is a, an incredibly important event within the battle, it is not above re-examination. We have always got to be in a position where we have the intellectual honesty to say to ourselves, I want to see what the new sources are, I want to see what they have to say. So that is, uh, I would say, one of our better contributions to understanding this particular battle, understanding that the Japanese, in fact, were kind of back on their heels as a result of all of the attacks uh, coming in and, and hitting them. And really, that sort of points out uh, a contribution uh, of VT-8 and VT-6 that is not commonly acknowledged. The common wisdom is that they dragged all the zeros down to, uh, to you know, sea level, and that made it impossible for those zeros to be back up uh, to intercept the dive bomber as well. And that's not quite true, because a zero fighter can climb from sea level to 15,000 feet in five minutes flat. VT-8 had been destroyed for, you know, 40 minutes, and all of its guys were dead. How does that prevent the zeros from going back up to a uh, stacking altitude? Really, what VT-8 and VT-6 did was to keep Nagumo off balance. He could never find that 45-minute window of opportunity that he needed to spot his flight decks and actually hit back against the, uh, the Americans. Thank you very much for your time.